Okay, technically the submarine does have rockets. The problem is they're not attached to the submarine. <laughs> really? By popular demand, we're going to check out some more XKCD what if. Would a nuclear submarine work as a spaceship? Good luck getting that thing into space. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. This question comes from Jason, who asks, how long could a nuclear submarine last in orbit? The answer is not very long. Yeah, I was going to say it's not really designed for orbital flight. It's You're designed to go the other direction with those, man. <laughs> but not for the reason I expected. The submarine wouldn't burst. Submarine hulls are strong enough to withstand 50 to 80 atmospheres of external pressure from water, so they'd have no problem containing one internal atmosphere of pressure from the air. And the hull would likely be reasonably airtight. Although watertight seals don't necessarily hold back air, the fact that water can't find a way through the hull under 50 atmospheres of pressure suggests that when the sub is in space, air won't escape quickly. So this sort of thing comes up with any sort of leak check. I mean, let's face it, nothing has perfectly zero leakage, completely perfect seals. I remember this came up at the nuclear plant that I worked at. We had our emergency diesel generators are designed to be completely sealed in just to ensure that the room doesn't flood. After all, having water near your emergency diesels, well, we saw what happened with Fukushima and that's not a good place to be. But you can't have actually zero leakage, but it's it's a very, very small number. That's less than like one drip per day is what it would figure out to. But I know there's different design criteria for, for designing something to go underwater versus designing something to go into space. Different sort of uh, tests are done, different types of leak checks, but that is true that you're not going to have a bit different criteria. And I'm seeing this note here, there may be a few specialized uh, one-way check valves which would let air out, but let's assume they can be closed. I mean, theoretically, you can solve something that can be closed, but again, nothing has leak that's entirely zero. The reactor containment building isn't 100% isn't leaks. Now, those leak numbers are even smaller than that. I remember testing, doing an integrated leak rate test during a refueling outage for a reactor containment building, and this is when we actually raised pressure. So up to about 9 psi. Now that's 9 psi gauge. So that figures out to a little over an atmosphere and a half inside. And that's a lot for something this big. Note how small the cars are. And acceptance criteria for something that big, don't remember it off the top of my head, but it's usually something like less than 1% of air volume during a 24-hour pressurized integrated leak rate test, which is a lot. And at that pressure, all the isolation, that is far above where all the isolation valves close. And many containment penetrations use double valve isolation. Dangerous carbon dioxide buildup wouldn't be an issue, as submarines use CO2 scrubbers that can be run indefinitely as long as they have power. But oxygen is another story. And if it's nuclear powered, uh, nuclear submarines can last 20 years without refueling. And when I say refueling, I mean, you're not actually going to refuel the thing since 20 years exceeds the lifetime of the boat. Aircraft carriers will get refueled maybe once, but subs typically no. Nuclear submarines use electricity to extract oxygen from water. In space, there's no water, so they wouldn't be able to manufacture more air. Yeah. <laughs> they carry enough oxygen in reserve to survive for a few days at least, but eventually they'd be in trouble. The really big... How long is this uh, voyage in space supposed to last? The problem, though, would be overheating, because space is so much warmer than the ocean. If you're pedantic, that's not really true. Space is, of course, very cold. But if you're even more pedantic, and I am, it is true in two different ways. Space? Well, there's no heat transfer, is, is what he's getting at. In Earth orbit, it seems cold because it's so empty. Without a warm environment around you radiating heat back to you, you lose heat by radiation much faster than normal. But space in Earth orbit is actually warm. The pedantic reason for this is that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of a collection of particles. And in space near the Earth, molecules can have average kinetic energies in the thousands of degrees. This is especially true if like, it's within line of sight of the sun. If it's when it's orbiting like behind the Earth relative to that, it can get relatively cold. I know that's, that's one concern that like astronauts that are doing spacewalks on the International Space Station have to do have to take into account is, are you in direct sunlight or not? 
and then they can calculate how much how much time they can they can stay. So presumably this sub crew would have to do something similar. This doesn't make space feel warm though. When I was a kid, I remember watching my dad use a metal grinder. Whenever metal touched the grinding wheel, sparks flew everywhere, sometimes falling in a shower on his hands and clothes. I couldn't understand why they didn't hurt him. After all, the glowing sparks were several thousand degrees. I later learned that the reason the sparks didn't hurt him was that they were tiny. The heat they carried could be absorbed into the body without warming anything more than a tiny patch of skin. That same logic is why you have fusion power plants that are in the hundreds of millions of degrees some even into single-digit billions, such as the Z machine, but it's not melting all of the steel and metals or igniting all the piece of papers in the room next over. One, I mean, it's granted it's it's in a it's in a containment structure, but still, it's relatively small on on a macroscopic scale. The hot molecules in space are like the sparks in my dad's machine shop. They might be hot or cold, but they're so small, and there are so few of them, they don't change your temperature very much. Instead, your heat. And he mentioned he mentioned radiation. That's going to be the main like radiative heat transfer because there's not really much to conduct or convect because there's so little density. These these molecules are just tiny. There's nothing like touching them. It's not going to do anything. Convection is not going to do much. It's mainly going to be thermal radiation from the sun as far as a heat source. Heating and cooling is dominated by how much heat you produce and how quickly it pours out of you into the void. And this is the practical reason that space is warm. Without air or water around you to carry heat away from your surface, you don't lose heat by conduction or convection, just radiation, which often isn't a very effective way to cool down. Radiation is extremely inefficient method of heat transfer. I, I remember in some of my safety analysis classes, the instructor said, if you're concerned about radiation-based heat transfer in the reactor, then your reactor has already melted down <laughs> to the point where conduction and convection pretty much did its job. So you're going to need those kind of crazy high temperatures for it to be a concern. So in other words, it's already game over at that point. For most human carrying spacecraft, the big problem isn't staying warm, it's keeping cool. And a nuclear submarine isn't just carrying humans, it's carrying a 200 megawatt nuclear reactor. It's hard to get good numbers on the efficiency of nuclear reactors in military submarines, but a conservative guess based on civilian reactors is that around half the reactor's energy, or around 100 megawatts, is lost as heat. That, that's generous. <laughs> Try two thirds of it. <laughs> and that's a bit, that's a bit more realistic. Now, now the one thing is submarines, they're not always, they typically don't sit at 100% power like commercial nuclear power plants unless they're doing some sort of maneuver. But they can sit in like 30 or something like that, which you'd never see in commercial nuclear power plants. So you might not have 100 megawatts of waste heat, but you could still have on the order of 30, 40, 50 megawatts, depending on what power level this uh, submarine is sitting at. Now in space, they could probably sit pretty low, but that's still a it's still a big heat source. To give you a sense of how big one megawatt is, that's about a thousand times more heat coming from your microwave at home. And you're dealing with tens of megawatts at this point. This heat is normally dissipated by seawater, but again, no water in space. Without cooling, a 200 megawatt nuclear reactor outputs enough heat to warm the entire submarine by about half a degree Celsius every minute. The now, a lot of that will be accommodated by the reactor coolant system though. So as long as you can have a stable loop, the, but the problem is there's no external source. So it's really, you're, you're not going to necessarily get to that 0.5 degrees Celsius per minute immediately is what I'm saying, but you will eventually once you heat up the coolant and that's when bad things start to happen as far as reactor control is concerned. If you don't have any big heat sink. The submarine would become too hot for human survivability within an hour. But the nuclear reactor isn't designed to warm the submarine in this way. So instead the heat would build up within the reactor and lead to a meltdown. It appears keeping a nuclear submarine in orbit is- I mean, you're removing your heat sink. Reactor coolant essentially has nowhere to go. Now, I disagree that it would happen within an hour because you're gonna start off based on that a lower power level and you're gonna have to wait for the reactor coolant to evaporate. It is gonna cool it even though it's, it's not gonna cool out to seawater, so it is eventually gonna heat up, but you're gonna have, you're gonna have a few hours, but you will have considerably less time compared to say a commercial nuclear power plant when it loses its external heat sink. On there, you're gonna have potentially a few days. And there's so many alternate sources for an external heat sink for a commercial nuclear power plant, whether it be additional sources of water 
or additional sources of piping, ways of moving the water to the reactor coolant system if for whatever reason several of them were to fail. Several additional modifications were put in for that after, after Fukushima within every plant in the U.S., including the ability to bring in external piping sources and external generators to run all of this additional equipment from a satellite location, and these can be brought in by helicopter if necessary. It's a bad idea. But to get out of orbit, the submarine would need to slow down enough that it hit the atmosphere, which would slow it down the rest of the way. Without rockets, it has no way to do this. Yeah, it, you'd be... <laughs> that was an interesting idea, having nuclear reactors in spaceship, but you'd, it, it'd be more like an, like an RTG, not, not really a reactor in the uh, traditional sense of the word, but like a, uh, a propulsion system like such as the ones used on the Voyager probes. And this thing works completely differently than a nuclear reactor. It's a lot simpler. It just uses decay heat from radioactive materials to generate electricity. The source is typically something like plutonium-238, and it releases heat. The heat is converted to electricity using thermocouples, and this electricity is used to power a probe. Now, that's not going to be a nearly enough power to run your nuclear submarine, but you're in space, so you're normally not going to put something like that in space. You're going to put something that uses very little energy but lasts a very long time. So it's designed for small things like space probes and, on Earth, remote instruments. Though there have been the cases of orphan sources with these. You can also use something like strontium-90 for this, but that's beta decay instead of alpha decay, which means if it is found by someone unaware, they don't know what this is, then it's more likely to become a hazard through that decay mode that is more penetrative and that also happens to be more radioactive. I'll pin a comment down below with a link to a video that describes what happens when one of these turns into an orphan source. Okay, technically the submarine does have rockets. The problem is they're not attached to the submarine. <laughs> really? <laughs> that threw me off. I didn't think he was going to go this way. And yeah, I mean, some submarines do have those. Uh, they're called boomer subs. I don't think there's an equivalent called a zoomer sub, but I guess you can call fast attack sub zoomer subs. Please, someone in the Navy, tell me I'm wrong about that in the comments. I really hope I'm wrong about that. <laughs> Launching the missiles won't meaningfully propel the sub, but they don't need to be attached. They just need to be turned around. If the ballistic missiles carried by <laughs> Turn around, so it's going to be banging up against the other side of the hull. Wow. Nuclear submarine were placed in the tubes backward. They could each change a large nuclear submarine's speed by about four meters per. I'm just picturing the thing like going down and then suddenly, because no restraint is, it just slides across to the side and like hits someone in the face. <laughs> Man. <laughs> second. A typical deorbiting maneuver requires in the neighborhood of 100 meters per second speed change, which means- So did they do this to get this thing in orbit? I think I, I, think I missed that part. <laughs> that the 24 Trident missiles carried by an Ohio-class submarine could be just enough to get it out of orbit. Now, because the submarine has no heat dissipating ablative tiles, and because it's not aerodynamically yeah. stable at hypersonic velocities, it would inevitably tumble and break up in the atmosphere. The debris- Man, that would be a hazard. A, a broken nuclear reactor in space now basically deorbiting, scattering a bunch of spent fuel, and it's going to be scattered across a wide area at this point. This would be a bigger radiological hazard. Now, granted, a lot of the fission products will burn up in the atmosphere, but still, I would say this is a bigger hazard, a way bigger hazard than a nuclear submarine sinking to the bottom of the ocean. Because even if the core uncovered and the core somehow fell out of the sub onto the ocean floor, you have basically a nigh infinite heat sink in the form of the ocean that is going to keep the core very well covered. Because that's basically what safety injection systems do in nuclear power plants is they're designed to keep the core covered in water so it doesn't heat up and melt the fuel. So yeah. This would be a lot worse of a hazard than simply a, a nuclear sub that sank to the bottom of the ocean. Be disintegrating in the air or plowing into the ground at several hundred knots. If you tucked yourself into the right crevice in the submarine and were strapped into an acceleration couch, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny chance you could survive the. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean that 
might be possible. Maybe if you had this sort of setup attached to your sub and it somehow survived and you jumped at the right height. Maybe. Rapid deceleration into the atmosphere. Then you'd need to jump out of the wreckage with a parachute before it hit the ground. Who's <laughs> designing these stuff? Yeah. So basically, you're going to have to put a bunch of non standard features into your submarine in order to have something like this even remotely possible, which you're basically better off just designing a spacecraft. If you ever try this, I have one piece of advice that is absolutely critical remember to disable the detonators on the missiles. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want, say, a fire to inadvertently cause electrical switches to arm things. There's actually a procedure if you have to evacuate the control room of a nuclear power plant that you not only turn a lot of systems off, you actually disable them. Because the only reason why you would evacuate the control room is if there's a fire in the control room or if there's a fire in one of the adjacent relay rooms, and if there's a fire in the relay room, that could potentially mess with some of the controls. So you disable them to make sure the fire doesn't mess with your controls before heading to your auxiliary shutdown panel and switch gear rooms where all systems, basically all the control room operators would operate everything from those auxiliary control rooms and everything else that isn't in those rooms would be operated locally and manually. It's a scenario that is well trained for, but we hope we never have to implement because that can be a pain. And you lack that whole central command and control structure because you have to basically talk to people in multiple areas and it's difficult to visualize the big picture plant status. Doable, yes. Safe, yes. Is it a pain? Yes. Thanks so much for the recommendation on this video. These, these are pretty good at explaining things at a pretty high level. And I'm glad to see XKCD form more of a presence on YouTube. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.